Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and New York Community Bank, MNT Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Capital One Bank, The Witkoff Group, Greenberg Traurig, Genova Burns. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investment Developers, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman US Realty.com, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, NA, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, MHP Real Estate Services, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, The CUNY TV Foundation, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Mr. Brooklyn. There's nothing but Mr. Brooklyn. The kid who went to Wingate, PS91, worked, makes lime rickies, you know, egg creams, you know, <laughs> then student government, Brooklyn College, you know, and the best, I'm sorry, the best borough president of Brooklyn, my friend Marty Markowitz. At Thank least you. during the 12 years I was borough. I was the best for those 12 years. I agree. I, I'll say, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll vote on that, okay, to make it even better. So tell me a little bit about your parents, you know. Tell me about your father, where he came from. Because you said, you, you, I think it was your grandmother who was a beautiful woman. The, my, my grandparents came from, uh, uh, from Europe, obviously, where most of the Markowitz. I thought you and, came from China. No, yeah, well, you know, right. listen, we consider the Chinese as the lost tribe I, of I, Israel. I, I realize. How I wish that was true, by the way. But um, the, uh, my grandparents, who I didn't really get to know that well, um, uh, except for my grandmother on my father's side, who uh, lived the longest of the four of them, but um, uh, uh, came from Europe and uh, uh, from Eastern Europe, of course, and then settled, in, I guess, at different locations in, in Brooklyn. Um, and uh, my grandpa lived to at least 100. Maybe he was a bit above 100. I'll never forget he had a full head of hair, even at 99 that I remember him, uh, and always immaculately dressed. And Maybe it was the Kasha Kanishas. That it was, was. could have been, but actually he was, his, I, 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 like I said, I don't remember him well, but I do remember that he was a good dresser. And uh, then I found out because I asked my mom and he was, uh, he worked as a clothing salesman for men and he was thin and tall. He was all, he also modeled suits. And then, um, um, uh, but the way he used to drink tea, um, and he didn't he, drink he coffee. Had a he had a glass and put it in the saucer. He would, he would take the sugar, put it on his tongue and then drink the tea from the saucer. He would pour it in that. So I guess that's very European so that's mom's for the time. Son. That would be my mom's side, correct. And, and, I never met her mother. She died before and, I was and, born. And dad's side? And on my father's side, um, I, uh, uh, my grandpa on my father's side died very, very young. And I, frankly, I don't remember him whatsoever. And my grandma, I think, was a housewife. Now, when your mother met your father... Right, uh, I asked about that, too. Right, so do you have the answer from your... Yes, sister? I do. Okay, tell me. Uh, they, uh, they, a bunch of guys went to the movies and then hung out... Uh, uh, Utica Avenue and Eastern Parkway 
which is not far from famous restaurant in those days, a, a great vegetarian restaurant, by the way. Uh, and uh, 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 he had her eye, his eye on my mom, and he was talking to some other woman who had no interest in him whatsoever. And then he saw my mother, and he started talking to her, and that's how they met. And he pursued her quite aggressively, I hear, and she wasn't interested initially, but then she was interested. Right. And they got married, what, in 44, I think? Uh, uh, well, if, it would have to be, right, because um, yes, 40, it's not like these days right, where 40, she got married three years after I came. Right, no, so, right, it had to be, certainly had to be in early early 44, so, I'm sure. Uh, do you remember the hospital you were born in Brooklyn? Because I know you were born in Brooklyn. Though. Yes, it was called... Uh, Brooklyn Jewish? Uh, Brooklyn Jewish Hospital that became Lefich General. General Hospital. And then now it's a Hasidic uh, school for girls. So you grew up in the Crown Heights neighborhood. Right, I grew up in the shadow of Ebbets Field. Right. The first apartment was where? It was 441 Brooklyn Avenue. Building is still there. Uh, and uh, on the corner of Empire and Brooklyn Avenue, and like I said, three short blocks from Ebbets Field. Unfortunately, no more Ebbets Field, but you took but there's care, Ebbets Field you, you, housing. You took care of that later on in your life. So, Dad, uh, your father, uh, who, who passed on at a very young age when you were nine and a half, he, he had he two 35. jobs. He was 35. He was 35. He had two jobs. He worked as a... Six days a week at six... Six days a week. And then uh, he would work during the day because the deli, most of their business was the after, afternoon through the evenings and full-time Saturdays and Sundays. But uh, during the week, he'd work at Cardinal Clothes, uh, and he was a shipping clerk. So he would shift the fabrics from one area of work to another. You know, when you and I got together in some of the articles, it said, you know, even though you weren't poor, you, you, you had a lot of the things. You had appliances. Yeah, you, things were fine until you... Pa you on the layaway plan. On the layaway plan. <laughs> right. okay. okay, but they were appliances on <laughs> yeah, the layaway right. plan. Okay, and then you, the entrepreneur, I mean, because you were always an entrepreneur, <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the jobs was uh, shoeshine. Now, do you remember where you were doing shoeshine? No, 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 oh, no. No, a newspaper delivery. Yeah, right, it was a newspaper Newsp delivery. You didn't do the shoeshine. But no, I didn't. It was the other borough shoeshine. president. Yeah, okay. no, I didn't it's do that. Island. But what I did do is I delivered uh, clothing uh, for two different tailors, and I delivered uh, butching, uh, meats for two butchers in the were, area. Were they kosher butchers? Uh, they were both kosher butchers, but one was more kosher than the other. But we didn't know from Glot in those days. There was no such thing that I recall. We didn't have any author Hasidic either in that area. Um, uh, but it was overwhelmingly Jewish, except for a few blocks down from uh, Leffitt's Avenue until Winthrop Street, and that was all Italian, now, all Italian. Now, we had that picture of you graduating PS91. Yes. You know, that, that young, good-looking guy. Yes, chubby, good-looking uh, guy. Yes, and, and then later on, okay, you know, you, your mother needed to reduce the rent expense and everything, and you were saying to me, Thank, thanks, Jake Javits, right? Tell the story about oh, that. Oh, there's no question that um, after my dad died, uh, even though we lived in a rent-controlled apartment uh, and the rents were moderate. However, when you lost your income, uh, and the only income my mom had was Social Security survivor benefits, plus the money that I brought in working after school and full-time on Saturday and Sundays, uh, it was not possible. She had three children, um, 18 months old, four years old, and I was nine. My sister, the other sister, four and a half, and then I was nine. So it was rough. Uh, it was very difficult to be able to eat and also to pay the rent. So uh, public housing was the best option. And uh, we tried our local elected officials. My mother tried her best and used to drag me along. And uh, frankly, uh, we got uh, nowhere. Uh, just a lot of baloney. Uh, and then uh, my mother finally wrote to uh, Jacob Javits and uh, to our Amazement, a few weeks later, we heard back from him that they're working on it. And then shortly thereafter, we got accepted. And now into you moved to the house. Bay. You moved to we moved to uh, Sheepshead Nostrand Houses, yes. uh, which uh, is a, uh, certainly was uh, at its time. And it still is an important uh, affordable housing option uh, for people of low and moderate income. Now, before you moved there, were you working at the... Uh the luncheonette, making the oh, yes. Greeks lime Right. And we were talking, uh, Bob, our uh, head of CUNY TV, said when he worked at Silver's, he made tuna fish in certain ways. 
Now, you worked in uh, the other luncheonette. Right, another luncheonette. Okay, but the good part was when you took the tuna fish, they, they even let you take it home. Isn't it? That's true, that's true, because, by the way, I made that tuna fish. I know how good it was. I used a lot of the beautiful Hellman's mayonnaise, and the tuna was white, pure white, and, and I, you know, we didn't have any machines. We didn't do it by machine. I had a... Uh, a plunger. I, 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 <laughs> and um, I hate to tell you, but it was the era before gloves and everything else and uh, but no no we were clean the the owner was meticulous about that and the, the tuna fish was great but i made great uh fraps and malteds in fact i used to have lines on friday and saturday nights why lines because when the owner wasn't looking yeah. i would put extra so it would flow over i loved the folks even though they couldn't drink it it flew it it, it, it was spilled so, so they loved to see so it was a lot you, it was your version of the jan's kitchen sink yeah well yes and of course jan's was well, very much part of my life that's right and jan's was right nearby you on it was on uh, flappish avenue uh, and church. I don't remember the other Jans. Isn't that strange? Flappish. I only remember the one, the largest one, which was on Flappish and Church Avenue. And I don't remember going to Jans as a child, but I do remember going in my teenage years. Now, when you were speaking of a teenager, you always wanted to be in politics, yes. student government and everything. And you told me that you decided at 16 years of age, you wanted to be borough president. What happened? Abe Stark was so, was he giving away suits <laughs> or bats or what was it? Well, I, I, I knew, I, listen, there are folks that are destined for their careers. There are others that become destined later on in life. I mean, uh, there's no question that I uh, always volunteered in uh, grade school, and kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth. I always seem to gravitate towards volunteering. I don't know why, but that's just the DNA I had, I guess. So what happens in the And Burrow then, uh, and then uh, uh, I remember that uh, we went on a field trip from um, uh, high school, Wingate High School. We went to uh, Borough Hall. I have to believe it was 1960. Uh, it had to be 1960, 61, somewhere around that period, because uh, we went to Borough Hall with the class uh, and took a tour of the building, of course, and it so happened that the borough president, Abe Stark, was there. Now, did you pick your office at that time? Well, I don't, I don't think I was thinking quite that way. And, uh, but I, I, I thought it was pretty fascinating that he was the president of Brooklyn. Um, and, um, and I must tell you, fast forwarding, when I became borough president, I found his desk uh, at Borough Hall. And, you and I moved that old desk up to the, my office. And it still has the prior to the days of phoning where you can call people right, and the, the buttons. it had buttons up and down the front of it of course not operable but uh but uh, so it wasn't so much of ape stock um as much as the aura of borough hall and the president of brooklyn that i met and i already was brooklyn centric now, now, even at that age now as you said you graduated wingate now where was the wingate graduation at wingate or was it no it was King? at the of course at the right. at the we, louise kings at the louise now kings. the right Bell. way of pronouncing it the mid midwest they would pronounce it lows but we said louise 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 kings louise kings, louise kings <laughs> where i graduated and you graduated <laughs> and probably half the crowd and then you go to brooklyn college and as we would say on the nine-year plan right nine-year plan uh, never nine saw daylight okay. <laughs> you you were a night owl Okay. Yes. Oh, so, yes. So you were at Brooklyn College, and you were president of the student student government evening fact, session student evening government. session for the student government. But during the day, what did Markowitz do? Okay, I mean, you worked for P. Laurelot. Well, listen. In those days, I was a smoker. Uh, no one thought that cigarettes were bad. In fact, I was three three packs. I was. I did smoke three packs a day when I was in. Uh, when I was in my uh, mid-teens and late teens and early adult, I gave it up when I was 27. So you worked for P. Lorillard, you worked for Bristol Myers, right? Where you were uh, calling on calling uh, on health, health and beauty health aids, and beauty drug aids. stores, and everything yes, else. You know? And then you, because of your personality, oh. you got involved with the employment business. Yes, yes. I mean fortune personnel. What happened? And barrister, barrister referral and fortune personnel. Uh, uh, and it, actually, it was a, a fascinating job. I, you know, I met men and women seeking to better themselves in life. Uh, and of course, 
It was rough because it was all commission. You didn't get paid unless you placed somebody. Very, that was very difficult. And I had a year and a half where I was doing pretty good. Uh, and then I had a year and a half where I was barely making the rent. Um, but uh, it was a fascinating job, but, but it's service. In other words, the service aspect is what turned me on, um, uh, helping, pe helping folks, uh, which is what government is all about. So what, what There's no other purpose to government. What happened? And you always were a tenants advocate, so what happened to 26 years of age? You got involved with the Tenants Association? Well, I mean, it was 1971, um, and um, the, uh, I had experiences, of course, when I lived... Uh, in uh, Crown Heights, we had a miserable landlord. I hate to say it, but his name was Mizrock, so I guess it's appropriate, um, who didn't uh, believe in uh, providing hot water and heat. Uh, um, and um, so I guess it started in those days, but it was clear uh, since I lived in Flatbush, uh, Ocean Avenue in particular, and Albemarle Road in Beverly, that there was no doubt a significant number of landlords that were disinvesting in their buildings. Uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one reason was to get the rent control tenants out and then jack up the rent and get as much as they can and provide as the least they can. So I stepped in. Uh, uh, it gave me a purpose in life and that was to organize the tenants. And I started with the building I lived in. And then someone heard around the corner that I did and I went over there. And then before I knew it, I started the Flappish Tenants Council, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it became, for its time, the largest uh, in any neighborhood of the city of New York. And I was very proud of it, and it kept me very, very busy, and very happy, actually. And then you, uh, then you uh, ran for public office. Yes, I ran for um, city council in 1973. And uh, listen, I'm not going to deny here in any manner, shape, or form that I didn't want to see political this, office. My, uh, my right. apple, you know. But there is no question that I was, that I had every intention seeking public office. Uh, and I knew that I had to prove myself. Um, and uh, I, I knew that when I was president of student government at Brooklyn College and prior to that in high school and prior to that in public school, that I had to serve others. I had to achieve in order to prove my worth. So the same thing happened when I got out of college. I started organizing in the community, and it was tenants and senior citizens because right. I founded the Senior Citizens League of Flappish, which is still, uh, is still in operation. In fact, the woman I hired in 1974 to be the center director is still the center director as we speak right now. Uh, and I ran for office in, uh, in 1973. And interestingly enough, it would have been against one of the major landlords in Brooklyn, who is now of blessed memory, uh, and he owned quite a few buildings and advocated for the landlords. So it would have been a classic battle between the tenant and the landlord. However, uh, uh, politics has strange fates. So you, you, can never, you, can never, you can never be sure that what's here will be there tomorrow and that was reapportionment year. Right, and, then and, you uh, and you... suddenly the world changed for me. I went from a, an all primarily tenant district to one that had some tenants and loads of homeowners and loads of neighborhoods to the south of where Flappish and uh, there was one part of the district that was only three blocks long to get into Gravesend, Coney Island, Brighton Beach, and then into Raritan Bay to the outer bridge area of Staten Island. Uh, so it was a very interesting district. Yeah. Uh, but you finally... And I came in second. I came in second. And when were you elected uh, later and on? Then, and then uh, five years later, I ran for the uh, state senate. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the major accomplishments you made before you even got to be borough president, the concerts. Let's yes. talk about the, the Flatbush concerts, the Midwood concert. Well, I, uh, uh, I was always interested in music. Um, and uh, as a boy, I... I, I, uh, I, I guess I loved Elvis Presley, and it sounds strange now saying that, but I did. And I especially wanted to learn how to play a guitar. And uh, uh, um, I took up once, I picked it up, and that was the end of that. And I forgot about that career, because it was uh, apparently, as I was growing, I wasn't necessarily getting significantly taller. And certainly, uh, the weight challenge has been part of my life, that's for sure. But whatever the case might be, uh, I put that on the back burner, and then I was elected to, uh, to serve in the state s Senate. And then as I was coming home 
uh, in January of my first year in public office, uh, I passed by um, Midwood Field, which uh, is right across the street from Edward R. Murrow High School. And um, I, I know it sounds crazy saying it, but it was a revelation that came to me. And I really believe that somehow something popped in my head uh, that, look at this field. I wonder if you could put concerts on here. Uh, and uh, that's, that's how it started. And, uh, concerts over there. And I you raised you, money. And you were the MC. You put a stage I was up. the MC. And we put or the tuxedos. We yes, of course. Initially, it wasn't a stage; it was pieces of yes, plywood. Was plywood from with, the local with lumber. somebody with somebody's uh, um, uh, living room lamp, uh, and with two little speakers that I borrowed. But from there, it really went into show business. It really did. Yeah, okay, Cap and, Calloway. Yeah, that right. was our first entertainer in 19, first nationally known entertainer, maybe beyond in 1989. But the concerts began in '79. And they filled a great need in the community of bringing people together, providing free entertainment. It gave me happiness. I, I, I brought a lot of happiness to a lot, of, a lot of residents, but it brought me a lot of happiness too, just seeing that I was doing something that mattered to someone now, that mattered. You then did, uh, because I want to make sure I get everything in the show. Oh, my goodness. Okay, you then took care of the MLK, the Martin Luther King. Well, it's not a matter of that. What happened no, was, implemented as, I, as, I, as the district changed, I got reapportioned into the largest uh, Senate district uh, of African Americans in New York State. I said to myself, I, I'm not going to drop the concerts that were in Midwood Field, but I can't ignore the large new constituents. And I said, you know what? I, I could do it here, I could do it there. Yeah. So I started the Martin Luther King Jr. Concert Series, and I got permission from uh, uh, Martin Luther King's wife, Coretta Scott King. She gave me permission to use his name and sign to make sure that I had the right to do it. And, uh, and we began the series, which had been phenomenal, yeah, yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. Then, then you moved the series, the other series, to Coney Island, to well, Brighton Beach. I yeah. didn't. I didn't move voluntarily. I, I realized. Let's just say I was. I, I was. You, you, you I had, had to leave. But what, what's very interesting turned out to be is, a blessing. Is, actually, is in 1999, you were giving out leaflets about the concert. I was giving out leaflets at uh, at uh, Manhattan Beach. Manhattan at Manhattan Beach well, at Kingsborough Community College. They have a beautiful beach there, uh, attached to the school. That's for faculty and students, and uh, they. Uh, were very kind. They allowed residents of uh, Manhattan Beach to, so to use the facilities too. So in the same way that too. you had the epiphany about the concerts, you had this epiphany of this woman sitting in. Well, let, listen. First off, anyone that goes to that beach knows that it's primarily either seniors that are my age now, or young. It was, or it was very young, young, young families with little kids, and there was a woman who was young, but certainly not. 18, 19, 22, and she was not certainly in her 70s or 80s, not that there's anything wrong with either of them, and she was alone, and she looked cute. So, come on, I'm... And I'm, you gave her... I was healthy and, then, and, and I'm healthy what, now. And you introduced yourself well, as I didn't, Marty I didn't, No, I didn't Your say... Your mother no, know me? I didn't say that. I went up and I gave her uh, a leaflet. I said, I hope you can, can attend the concerts, and she looked at me, went right back reading, and she was doing the crossword puzzle, the Times crossword. Of course, underneath that, she had the star and inquire. It's a good thing that wasn't on top. But anyway, so she was doing the crossword puzzle, and I, I saw some friends, and I came back near her blanket, went to my friends. She wasn't paying me any attention. And then she got up to leave the beach. I think it's because I was hovering around, and she was there just to, just to have a few hours on her own, uh, just for herself, you know. And uh, as she left, I ran to her, and I said, my name is uh, Marty Markowitz. I, I, I don't know if you're married or single, <laughs> but uh, I'd love to, you know, here's my card. And she looked at it, and I said, and she said, I said, uh, maybe your parents know me? She said, I, uh, I, I said, idea. she said something like, uh, I thought uh, D'Amato was senator. I said, yes, he, he is senator, but Al D'Amato was United States senator around the States. And I, oh, okay. And she left. I never got a name. Never got a name. What happens two weeks later? Well, she went back to her mom's house, and then she asked her mom, and her mother said, I never heard of him either. <laughs> so right away, they must have thought I was the biggest liar in the world, handing out make-believe cards. But, um, of course, I never served Manhattan Beach as a senator. Uh, and, but it wasn't, too, it wasn't a couple weeks later. It was, it was two days later 
It was January 3rd when I met her. In 1999, there was a heat spell. It was 100, 101, 102. June 3rd. So, uh, uh, no, July, July 2nd, okay. we met. And then July, I'm sorry, July 3rd, we met. July 4th was the holiday. And July 5th, I went back to the beach, this time not giving out leaflets, hoping that, that she might be there. And she went back to the beach, hoping that I might come back to find her. And we did. And then, and then, you and that were, was it. And then you were married. And three okay. dates later, I proposed, and she said yes on the fourth. Okay. And then we were married at a the few Brooklyn months. Botanical later. Gardens at, in the Palm Room. A few months later, not because there was any no, no, no rush to marry. No, no, because uh, it was like it was two minutes <laughs> left. I'm caught in a short time. It's you and then the parrot. What That's right. Name? Beep. Beep, Beep is our son. Okay. Beep, your son, who we have a picture eating a bagel. Yes. Since we know he's a member of the tribe. So you're elected borough president, and during that period of time, you know, you, I think the comment was Cousin Brucey, you called Bruce Ratner. Yes. You were the biggest, and, yes. Okay, you were the biggest pain in the rear to him. He had no idea. He said, I don't like, I don't like residential. I don't like stadiums. I don't like sports. And Marty said, I got to get a team back because look what happened to Brooklyn, right? Mm -hmm. So that was one of the major things. And, you know, without, with, without Bruce and you and the pushing, I don't think there would be an Atlantic Yards and the other situation of the affordable housing. Well, let, let me just say, uh, when the history of Brooklyn is written, Bruce Ratner is going to have a large chapter or two or three. Uh, there's no doubt that initially when I, uh, when I knew that this was only one shot of Brooklyn getting a national team, it comes around, if you're lucky, every 100 years. But to his credit, after some pleading and, and prodding, whatever, he took the steps. He could have walked away a million times. Right. But he, he knew that Brooklyn, he has invested his life and his company in Brooklyn, and he deserves all of all the good results that he's gotten and, as and I, is getting. And as I say, stated before, we both went to the Lowy's Kings. They, they closed in 1977. 30 years later, Marty Markowitz with the New York City Economic Development, with the mayor, with a variety of people work. And now after $94 million of restoration, February 3rd is the opening with an evening with Diana Ross. I mean, it would have been nice if Barbara Streisand did it. Yeah, I, she... I, would have, I would have loved that. And uh, also Billy Joel, because Billy Joel may be a Long Island kid, right. but his grandparents took him to the movies right. every week, when, and they lived in Dittmas Park. By the way, the Flappish Development Corporation deserves a lot of credit, right. and the residents of Flappish that kept the faith uh, and really uh, Ronnie Schweiger, Bruce Friedman, there's so many folks out there, and, and Michael Weiss especially, and the, and, the, and the board of the Flappish Development Corporation, and my colleagues in government that we made sure not to have that theater demolished and held it and had the city restore. And Seth Pinsky, I want to salute him and EDC because they made it happen. Now you're helping the city of New York with New York City and Go, with tourism. And they're and a tremendous agency, Michael. I must tell you that over 55 million visitors this year, a record breaking. And it doesn't happen just through the sky. These professionals, and believe me, they're the professionals. They work. You have no idea. They're the unsung heroes. And so much of the city's economy depends upon the strength of our tourism. So bravo, NYC and company, and Ma Fred Martin, Dixon, Martin. Brian Grimaldi, Kelly Curtin. To me, I'll always be Mr. Brooklyn. Now, the new borough president is Mr. Brooklyn. Everyone living in Brooklyn is Wait, Mr. and Ms. Brooklyn. But to me, it's my proudest title. Thanks for being here today. And thank you for inviting me.